All right, you guys. Give me one second to get everything set up. Okay. All right, you guys. So welcome to today's webinar. Um, it's going to be over partnerships with your local housing authorities. Hope you guys are in the right place. I'm happy to have y'all. A um, couple of things before we jump into the webinar. Um, I just want to give you guys a little bit of background on NCHB. We um, are part of our role, at least, is sharing best practices that we find in the community with other communities. And um, we also work directly with veterans through a helpline and we work in the policy space. And um, so we kind of have our hands in a bunch of different things. This webinar series is a new thing for us. Uh, we started it this year. This is our second one quarterly webinar. Um, and it came from a lot of feedback from our conference that we had last year, a virtual conference where people basically just wanted more time to hear topics and share stories and share practices without having to wait for our conference every year. A um, Couple of housekeeping things. Everybody who's in attendance is on mute. Um, the only way you'll be able to communicate with me or the presenters to ask questions and things like that is through the chat box. You should see a panel on the right hand side of your screen um, and that will be how you send questions in. Um, we will be doing at least 10 minutes at the end for questions. And then just one other thing, the webinar today is recorded. You guys will be getting videos as well as slides if you'd like them. And the webinars will be located on our new website and CHB just did a update. Um, so this webinar, the previous webinars and our future webinars and stuff will be located online moving forward. Um, so my name is Jasmine. I'm a housing program associate at NCHV. Some of you have seen me before, um, either through the webinars, you've heard me on our podcast, or you've seen me at conference. Um, so yeah, I'll be moderating today and getting us started here. We're gonna have four different speakers or four different segments of the presentation today. The first speaker, um, Elaine, she'll be speaking to you guys from the Housing Authority in San Luis Obispo, California. Then we'll have Jackie Martinez, and she's going to be speaking to you guys from the Housing Authority at the City of Milwaukee. And um, then we'll have Karina, and she's coming to you guys from the Housing Authority of the County of San Joaquin um, in California. And then we have Nuli, who is our hud -Vash team member, and she is also going to be speaking with Karina um, towards the very end to do kind of a Q&A on how their partnerships work together. Um, so just for the format, they'll be covering a couple of different topics. A little bit about HUD VASH, um, some about their other housing programs, and then they're going to touch on how the housing authority will, um, you know, is is developers and how the housing authority has preference veterans and some of their other mainstream programs. Um, the three housing authorities that are participating today, you guys have probably heard or seen them before. Um, some of them have been on our podcast to talk about their affordable housing properties. Others have been in are featured in our housing guides and some of our other resources on, um, you know, uh, HUD VASH or COVID operations and things like that. Um, let me see. I will drop the link for our podcast and our other housing guides in the chat throughout this webinar so you guys can go back and reference them. Some of the topics kind of cross over to today's webinar, but uh, if you want to hear more about their housing programs or their developments after today, then that's a good way to learn more. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Elaine. Thank you, Jasmine, and thank you for inviting us to participate in the this webinar today. Uh, next. The Housing Authority of San Luis Obispo is in the county of SLO, is how we refer to ourselves, and we are halfway between LA and San Francisco. So we're a pretty small community, only about 250,000 and we're about three hours uh, from either LA or San Francisco. Typically, the, the major challenges that we see with the Section 8 program is that the waiting lists are long, that the applicant needs to do the work to find the housing and to find a landlord who's willing to take uh, their voucher, and that payment standards may not always reflect market rents, especially if you're in a rising, a cost market, which is very much uh, the case here throughout all of California. And then under California law, there is a, we are required to offer a preference for veterans, both in our Section 8 and our landlord um, programs. Next. 
In order to more effectively serve our local community, what we have done to enhance our program and the services uh, operating a Section 8 program is that we try to open the waiting list every 12 months or so. We have to estimate how many vouchers we're going to need over the next 12 months, and that's based on people turning the voucher back into us, either because they've become self-sufficient, there's been a change in their family composition, or they're no longer on the program. So we're never quite sure what that is, but our typical experience is we'll open the waiting list for four days. It's online. And so they've got lots of time to apply. They don't have to you know, be on at 9 a.m. They've got four days. And then we run a lottery. And so because we're in a small community and we're relatively isolated from our neighboring communities, we may get about 2,000 applicants and we will select 250 to 500 in the lottery. So you've got a one in seven to one in 10 chance of being selected in the lottery. And the reason we do it that way is that it gives people hope. If I didn't get selected this year, maybe I'll get selected next year rather than the waiting list is closed for years and years and years and, and there's never any option to get on. Once you're on the waiting list and you're selected, We've also streamlined our intake process. So we're required by law to do a briefing. So we purchased a video, it's about 20 minutes long to explain all the program regulations. They come in for their appointment. They've done a lot of the paperwork online already, if possible. We have an hour to two hour appointment with them and they walk out with a voucher. Um, and so it, it's a real feeling of accomplishment for the participant to know that at the end of their intake appointment, they've got a voucher and they can immediately start looking for housing. Next. In order to address the needs of our landlords, because without our landlords, we wouldn't have anywhere for our participants to live. And so our services to our landlords, we feel are really, really important in this community. So we commit to performing a move-in inspection within 24 to 48 hours after receiving a request for tenancy approval. We're continually monitoring the market rates and the payment standards and the success rates to make sure we set our payment standards at a, a level that will enable our participants to find housing. Our HQS inspector uh, is a, has freed up some time because we do biennial inspections now instead of annual under the regulations. And so he is also the landlord liaison. So if the landlord is having an issue with their participant, they can call either their housing specialist or the HQS inspector and we can talk them through the issues that we're having. And the final thing that we do to serve the needs of our landlords is we assign our participants to a housing specialist by landlord so that the landlord has only one housing specialist to call. They don't need to try and figure out, oh, for tenant A, it's housing specialist B, and for tenant C, it's a different housing specialist. We just give them one housing specialist. Next. The role of Haslo, which is similar to many other housing authorities, uh, is that we are also a developer of affordable properties. And uh, the most significant development is done through what is called the LIHTC program or tax credit, and it's the low income housing tax credit program. Uh, and then I'll just run through briefly some of the voucher and affordable housing uh, programs that we offer here at Haslo. In 2010, we received our first allocation of BASH vouchers with additional allocations every year after that. 2013 was our first project-based voucher, which means that the voucher is tied to living at a property of a developer. And so a developer under the LIHTC program comes and, and competes and asks for PBV vouchers. And now we know our participant has a landlord that they can use that voucher with, and there's separate waiting lists that we use to manage those waiting lists and those vouchers. Next. In 2014, using the guidance for in 2013 from HUD, we created what we call set-aside vouchers, and we now have over a dozen agreements with agencies, nonprofit agencies in our community that work with those who are homeless or have recently become homeless, uh, such as the women's shelters, 
the mental health organizations. We've done one now with Adult Protective Services. The fastest growing group of homeless, especially here in California, are the elderly. And so Adult Protective Services has expanded the work that they do in the community and, and we've partnered with them to issue vouchers, as well as the traditional uh, networks of the uh, homeless shelters. In 2017, we built a tax credit property that was dedicated to veterans. Um, half of them would have a VASH voucher and the other half, there was a preference for veterans. In 2019, we partnered with the local mental health association and we dedicated 33 units to those living with a mental illness. Next. In 2019, we had a public housing program. We've converted that through RAD and are in the middle of finalizing the renovations worth over $17 million. Those units were 40 years old and they're now being renovated. We also received an award of family unification programs to work with child welfare services and families that um, their final step in being reconnected to their children may be to find housing and those vouchers enable them to do that. We received mainstream vouchers. And in 2020, um, California did something called uh, a home key program during COVID where they rented hotel rooms or motel rooms for those that were homeless and living in congregate shelters to create a way of providing housing for them that was safer during COVID. And that became project so that was room key, that became project home key. And we were able to buy a 120 room Motel 6. It closed within six months of the NOFA being published. And within six months, we had to be 100% occupied. And that 120 unit motel has now become 60 units of permanent housing under a housing first model and 40 units of an emergency shelter in a community that did not have an emergency shelter before. So um, from start to finish within a year, 100 homeless individuals have moved into some kind of housing, either permanent or congregate shelter. And then starting next month, we will have 156 emergency housing vouchers to offer to the community through our nonprofit agencies. Next. We, uh, in order to educate our community uh, about all of the different programs that HASLO offers and how affordable housing and rental subsidy and VASH vouchers and everything work, we offer what we call a Housing 101 class. It used to be in person, but since COVID, we've been doing it over Zoom. And it's for our the general public, for landlords, for um, case managers who are working with those who are looking for housing, just to give them some, some education. We are an active member of many communities and groups in the county that work with the homeless, such as the Supportive Housing Consortium, which is an alliance, uh, NEXT, um, and they provide the TBRA or the Tenant-Based Rental Assistance Funding. NEXT. Other agencies, the Adult Services and Policy Council, Homeless Services Oversight, um, Veterans Organizations, uh, we partner with all of them and participate in their quarterly or monthly meetings. Next. Uh, we, uh, with respect to the veterans programs, we do have an active VASH program. Uh, we are about 75% utilized on our VASH vouchers. We would like that to be higher, but like I said, we were three hours away from um, the main veterans office in Southern California. And so, um, sometimes we're a little out of sight, out of mind, and it's it's hard to get the attention of the VA and, and hard for them to keep um, caseworkers here. And so we're not as highly utilized on those vouchers as we would hope. Um, in order to manage the VASH vouchers, we meet monthly with the VA and PATH case management teams. The VA has outsourced the management of some of their VASH vouchers to an organization called path. And in those monthly meetings, we talk about uh, the intake process. We've dedicated two, um, two times a month where that is set aside solely for VASH intake so that at the last minute, they can always throw someone onto the schedule. 
we talk about paperwork and recertification charge concerns, and we talk about housing search challenges. Next. We've also created an ad hoc report from our system to give the VA caseworkers a listing of all their participants and their annual recertification date so that they can support their veterans uh, with the paperwork requirements. And like I said, we've uh, committed to certain intake dates. Next. And then uh, I didn't list the websites here, but both HUD.gov and VA.gov have excellent resources, slides, uh, materials on both of their websites uh, with respect to the BASH program. And I think that's the end of my slides. So thank you very much um, for this time. Good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jackie Martinez, and I'm the program director of the Section 8 program for the Housing Authority of the City of Milwaukee. Today, I'd like to share um, our experience with working with our veterans and how we serve them. The Housing Authority of the City of Milwaukee has been a national leader in housing for over 70 years and currently provides high quality affordable housing options to over 10,000 Milwaukee families, seniors, and disabled adults. We also offer work to work with our residents um, to assist them in achieving self-sufficiency through a wide range of economic, health, and social services. Ha housing Authority currently administers 374 VASH vouchers. Um, currently, we have a development that is 101 project-based vouchers. That would be the soldier's home, the National Soldier's Home. The Housing Authority of City of Milwaukee and the Alexander Company, which was a developer, partnered together to construct National Soldier's Home residence to be known as the Soldier's Home that is located in Milwaukee on the Milwaukee VA Soldier's Home District. This development consists of 101 units scattered throughout the campus among six different buildings. That, that includes um, single room occupancy, that includes um, one unit apartments, duplexes, and a single home. Established just after the Civil War, the Milwaukee VA Soldiers Home is a 90 plus acre district that rests on the grounds of the Clements Blocky Medical Center. The Soldiers Home Recuperative Village and Landscape were designed to be a place of refuge for Civil War soldiers to aid their recuperation and help ease their transition back to civilian life. One of only 43 national historic landmarks in Wisconsin, it contains some of the oldest and most historic buildings in the VA system. The next development would be the Victory Manor. The Housing Authority City of Milwaukee has developed this 60 unit veteran preference apartment building in the West Lawn Gardens neighborhood on Milwaukee's Northwest side. Victory Manor has many design features to meet the specific needs and opportunities that our veterans face. The Center for Veterans Issues provides case management services to our veterans living at Victory Manor. The presence of CVI also serves as a resource for veterans throughout West Long Gardens and the surrounding neighborhood. All veterans are invited to utilize CVI's resources to access a wide array of services. The next project is our surgeon's quarters, single room occupancy located on the VA grounds. Um, this operation started in 2005 um, and this was placement at this property. It was to coordinate between the Department of Veteran, Veteran Affairs, Hope House, and Friends of Housing. Located at the historic Veteran Affairs grounds in Milwaukee, the Sur Surgeon's Quarters Single Room Occupancy, SROs, is a joint project of Hope House of Milwaukee, the Housing Authority of the City of Milwaukee, the Department of Veteran Affairs, and Friends of Housing, which is a property managing company. The project consists of 13 bedroom Section 8 SRO program that provides permanent housing to adult men and women in a communal setting. 
Along with an individual room, each resident is provided with shared kitchen, living, and bathroom areas. In addition, a case manager works closely, closely with the residents to assess, refer, link, and engage, each in the necessary supportive services to help maintain stable housing, such as transportation assistance, mental health, and substance abuse counseling, educational opportunities, healthcare, and emergency food distribution. The following um, would be the Veteran Affairs Supportive Housing Match Vouchers. So the program has a total of 374 VASH vouchers and 273 are tenant VASH based vouchers. We also have some port ins that we also manage. The program um, finds that it's very important and crucial um, in the success of these partnerships to assist our veterans is establishing the partnerships with the local HUD office, with uh, the local VA, the Veteran Affairs um, Office, um, the support of the elected officials, um, local, state, and federal level. Um, we are very fortunate to have all of those, hence why our projects have been deemed to be successful and we are able to continue to serve our veterans um, and their needs. We meet with the case managers um, assigned for each of our participants um, in the program. Um, we meet with them weekly. And the reason for that is that we want to make sure that all of our veteran, veterans are being serviced um, and attended to in a timely fashion. So having these weekly meetings um, definitely allows to minimize um, any issues or concerns there may, there may be regarding a participant in their housing. The program has also um, assigned a housing navigator that is the point of contact uh, between um, the VA, uh, case management, and community resources that have questions about a participant's um, subsidy or um, questions about their housing. Um, this housing navigator um, has become familiar with our families and is able to assist them um, in every shape, way, or form um, to ensure successful housing and permanent housing. The, the, program, um, the program has had um, many, uh, many, many questions regarding the um, arrival of, of these projects. Um, again, it, it is very um, important to have those, those supports um, within your community. Um, we work very closely with the HUD, local HUD office. Um, they're very supportive of our, our projects as we um, assist our veterans. We um, have the support of our local leaders um, and also community, community organizations that also advocate for our vets. At this moment, we continue to, to serve our veterans through the various services that we offer, um, such as the self-sufficiency, family self-sufficiency program. And um, we also have the opportunity for our veterans to become homeowners as well. Um, as we continue to move forward, we welcome um, any suggestions or ideas that our community members bring to the table. And, um, as I always say, the Housing Authority City of Milwaukee rarely ever says no. We are always looking at innovative ways and um, out of the box um, ideas to, to serve and, and cater to our, our needed community um, within the veterans and their families. Thank you everyone for your time. Hello everyone, my name is Karina Lane. I'm the Director of Occupancy and Housing Compliance for the Housing Authority of the County of San Joaquin. 
We are centrally located, uh, well, we're located in Stockton, California. So a little bit about us. Uh, we were established in 1942. We're governed by a seven member uh, board of commissioners. Um, Housing Authority oversees a 50 plus million dollar budget. Um, we assist approximately over 19,000 people, individuals within the, our, our community. And our primary funding source is HUD. So some, a few highlights about the voucher program. You heard some of the stuff from the other presenters. Um, where the, it's low income affordable housing program. Um, we allow, the, the program allows participants to select units in the private rental market um, and the rent's based on their, um, their income. Housing authorities establish, we establish the, the eligibility uh, we also perform criminal screening uh, and the landlord performs the suitability. Rents are established using uh, the federal government's fair market rents. The landlord and the housing authority enters into a, a HAP agreement and the participant pays 30% of their income towards rent and housing authority pays the landlord the remaining. And participants are obligated to comply with the rules and lease agreements. So we have some special programs. Um, one of our highlights of the day is our, our BASH program. Um, and this program combines, combines the rental assistance of the Housing Choice Voucher Program with home, for homeless veterans with case management and clinical services provided by the Department of VA. The mainstream vouchers provides housing choice voucher rental assistance for non-elderly disabled persons. And our family unification program provides rental assistance for families whose children were placed out of the home and youth who aged out of foster care. So uh, just a little about how we got to where we are with our programs. Our VASH program, we have an allocation of 259. And that allocation started around 2009 and subsequently we receive um, um, allocations throughout over time that led us, our last allocation was actually uh, December, December 2018. So we're at 259 of, with our allocation for fast vouchers. Our main, oh, and, and the partnerships are, are the, the, num, the main partner is, is the Department of VA. And we also have some partnerships with the Stockton Shelter for the Homeless and Catholic Charities. Um, they, the referrals come, the referrals for VASH must be routed or vetted through the VA. However, we receive the we receive uh, referrals from the Stockton Shelter for the Homeless and Catholic Charities, and we just um, refer them through the VAS so that they can be vetted the proper way. Mainstream vouchers: we have an allocation of 133. Our mainstream voucher first allocation was August 2018, and we have partnerships that refer for these these um, these vouchers for non-elderly disabled families and those partnerships are some of this is just a sum to name a few mary magdalene these are uh these are 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 agencies community agencies that service disabled families or disabled individuals uh, drill san joaquin Beha county behavior health um, community medical centers and san joaquin general hospital our family unification vouchers, we have an allocation of 74. We have only received one allocation for uh, the family unification vouchers, and that was that was some time ago, uh, I believe. Was, that was some time ago. It was before my time. We have an agreement, a formal agreement with, with um, Human Services of San Joaquin County to help us, um, you know, to vet and, and have those families referred to receive 
permanent rental assistance. And we just received the emergency housing vouchers and we have an allocation of 252 vouchers. Uh, we will begin, um, we have started the referral process, but we have a partnership with uh, the San Joaquin County Continuum of Care and 211 San Joaquin County who will be making the referrals from for these vouchers to the housing authority. So our, our, the, res, the responsibilities between the housing authority and the VA, um, the, the VA, they're, they're responsible for screening all the veterans before they come to the housing authority. So they make, they, they screen, they do their due diligence to make sure the veterans are, are, are um, meeting the, the, the guidelines of hud Bash program. They make the referrals to the housing authority uh, they, 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 they do a very good job, I have to say, our, our VA, we have a, a very good relationship with them and um, they do a good job in assisting and locating suitable, suitable um, unit. They do a very good job at communicating with the housing authority. So we have, you know, the, the, the partnership there, um, it's evolved. We, we started, we were in a different location. We used to have a, a veterans, the, the vast clinic on our site until we moved into a different location and when we were not, we're not able to, to, you know, didn't have the capacity to do so. Um, and of course the VASH, the VA case managers, they provide case management and clinical services. Housing authorities responsibilities, refer, make, process the referrals that we receive from the VA and we determine eligibility. eligibility. We issue the, homeless veteran voucher. We inspect the unit for, to ensure that it meets the housing quality standards. Uh, we perform annual certifications and we have, you know, the most important thing here is to communicate. We have communicating the activity with the VA case managers so they, they're, they're informed of all the activity because there's times when our veterans, you know, are not following the guidelines of the program. And so if we reach out to the VA, they can they can help us in that process, help us, you know, bring things, get them back to the table. So that's that's an, a, an important component to this relationship. And that wraps up my presentation. I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. Okay, so I'm back. I uh, We're going to do a little brief discussion before we jump in the audience Q&A. Um, so Karina, who just spoke, she works for the Housing Authority, um, and we're going to have her supervisory social worker um, for her HUD bash team speak kind of in conjunction with her and answer a couple of questions on how their partnership works and how they work together. Um, this should be pretty helpful for other um, VA employees, but also maybe to give a little bit more understanding to veteran service organizations or frontline organizations on who the different people are who kind of run the HUD bash process. A couple of the questions I've got in the chat and then also that we get throughout like our calls and talking with local communities is how to really access the programs to begin with um, before the point of even um, doing the evaluation through the VA to make sure veterans qualify for VASH or um, actually connecting them and enrolling them in programs is just like who do we contact and what do they do so hopefully this q a will help a little bit um, to better understand what their their specific roles are um so just want to reiterate um and i i guess we'll let newly go first and then karina if you want to add anything um can you help us identify what your actual formal partnerships are and what your roles are in each of in, in, in the plan. Sure. Um, for for our VASH program, of course, I work for the VA and I'm the supervisor for a HUD VASH Central Valley team, which consists of two different counties. One is with the um, San Joaquin Housing Authority and the other is with the Santa Claus Housing Authority. Um, 
we have a formal relationship with our housing authority, of course, <clears throat> but we also have informal partnership with other community programs that work with homeless veterans, like the VSO, um, the COC, Continuum of Care, um, and various shelters in the area. Um, let's see. So with our role, like Karina mentioned in her, her PowerPoint presentation, is that we do uh, check our veterans. We, when we get a referral, we also do outreach um, to different shelters and different programs for any vets who have never heard of HUD bash and are homeless and needing assistance. So we do vet them in terms of making sure that they do qualify for VA healthcare, uh, and then that, that they are homeless. Um, and then at that point, we help them obtain all the paperwork that's required for, the, for their application with the housing authority. And uh, we forward those referral to the housing authority for processing. So yeah, just kind of like what Nuli said, I, of course I agree. Um, yeah, so that, yeah, we have the formal partnership with, with the VA. Um, we have other informal partnerships. Uh, I think I listed some of those in my presentation. And um, we have a preference where we have, we have a, a veteran's preference that's required, but we also have a, another preference for um, transitional or homeless um, individuals. So they don't have to be veteran or just anyone in general. So we have informal partnerships with a lot of the community partners in, within our San Joaquin County that are aware of this preference. They have to make the referrals to the housing authority. And so we we see, you know, people that are generally homeless or people that are transitioning from a, you know, a, a transitional environment, a temporary shelter environment into permanent housing. So that's that's another way that we are getting um, a hold of those maybe homeless veterans that are not eligible for VASH. <clears throat> right. I also wanted to point out, I started with HUD VASH about 10 years ago, actually, as a regular a case manager in, in San Joaquin County. So and I worked there for about a year before transitioning to another area within our VA HUD VASH program. Um, but at that time, you know, it was just myself and one other case manager and 50 vouchers at that point. And we didn't really have any formal partnership at that time. It's just we got the vouchers, go get your vets and get them housed, is what we've been told. Uh, but throughout the years, luckily, the previous supervisor um, I had really developed that partnership with the, our housing authority. And it's been really wonderful um, because without the formal partnership, you know, there's a lot of communication that's been lost, or there are things that we might not be able to work out with our vets in terms of documents that they require, but for some reason they can't get it. So the housing authority has been really great in terms of going, okay, if you if they can't, if you can't get this document, maybe we will consider this, and that has been super helpful in getting some of our, our vets processed through the program and getting them housed. Great, great. Okay. Well, I think um, we'll jump into the next question. It seems like you guys have both formal and informal partnerships, um, probably the housing authority more so than the VA. And uh, I, I guess what I'm wondering is how COVID-19 impacted your relationship. Um, if your partnership was affected by this, some of the feedback we've had over the last year is that um, with operational changes because of COVID-19, several communities have had little to no contact with their housing authorities or their housing authority relationships have been damaged a little bit because of closures and um, just operations not really lining up. So I'm wondering how COVID impacted your relationships and lessons you guys might be using from this experience to improve your working relationship. So it, yeah, we, it was, it, it, it was impactful, especially in the beginning. Uh, you know, we, 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 we fell into this pandemic. We, no one was sure. We weren't sure what to do. Um, we were sending our eligibility staff home to work from home. So that, you know, that was a barrier there. Um, once we got everybody home and into, you know, you know, provide, provided them with all the tools and equipment that they needed, 
for one, we we have assigned one case manager for one well, one we, what we call leasing specialist to our our bash uh, for our bash uh, participants. So if there's an issue with VASH, they know who to contact. We don't have a million other people that they have to, to contact. They have one person that they can contact. And then, you know, newly knows who to contact. If there's any bumps in the road, she knows she has our direct contact lines or, you know, any you know ways to get in contact with us. And we've run into some roadblocks. We've run into issues during COVID, um, you know, like, you know, things that they are, participants can't provide. And thankfully when HUD came out with the waivers, HUD came out with, with COVID waivers that we were able to adopt into our policies where we can get away with some of the things that we were previously required to have. We were able to, we were able to you, know, you, know, you know, cut some corners somehow because you know, social security offices were, were closed. Um, you know, a lot of the, the, the main documents that our homeless veterans needed to get through the eligibility process they just were not able to access so you know I get a call from newly Karina what can we do and then it just so happens that the waivers were out and let's let's check the waivers and see what we can do so we found ways you know it took a little time but we found ways to get overcome a, a lot of the hurdles that we were facing <clears throat> Yeah, I definitely have to agree with Karina. It was bumpy in the beginning when we're all trying to figure out, you know, a technology and working from home and how to manage referrals and paperwork and all of that. But um, but we were able to adapt. And I think communication with the housing authority has improved because now we can do virtual meetings. And, um, and I want to thank Karina actually for having um, floor attend our weekly meetings. And that has been really helpful in terms of getting, you know, feedback immediately as like, what is this paperwork? Um, is this application complete? Is there anything else that's missing? You know, so that's been extremely helpful. Yeah, and, and pre-COVID, we we would have one of the BASH representatives come, come in to the office uh, monthly and we would do a reconciliation. We would just check against, you know, what they have versus what we have and just balance balance our numbers and, you know, balance our, 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 our progress. Because we you know, if you're not communicating, you're really not sure what's going on. So we would do that pre-COVID, but once COVID hit, we had to find a way to, so we just recently we were um, invited to our, the, the HUD Bash weekly meetings and that seems to be, be working. So more frequent meetings, it sounds like. I, I, um, I guess final question, for how you handle your communication. And then you can also talk a little bit about working with outside organizations, um, Karina. But how do you guys handle when there's a breakdown in communication, whether it be the VA Medical Center and how you guys get your referrals or how um, community service providers might be reaching out to you um, or communication issues between the VA and the housing authority? Um, how do you guys handle when there's actually a breakdown in communication? Well, I can tell you, Newly will just pick up the phone and she'll call. <laughs> or, 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 you know, you know, so once, you know, we I, I try my best to pay attention, you know, when when Newly's emailing me, that means that, you know, something needs attention. She's not just gonna email me for, you know, just because she wants to say hi to me, but <laughs> she will email me because, you know, you typically, when she, th th there's a need, there's a barrier that we need to, we need to, we need to have a discussion. And we're always open. We're always open to that. Whenever you know there's a need, let's let's talk about it. And we usually, almost always, we we get through it with with mm -hmm. communication. So that 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 it, it's very important to open those lines of communication and have a point of contact, and not have your your community partners uh, just searching for someone to to get an answer. It's not fair to to the people that we're trying to serve. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, being flexible and, you know, being open to meetings and trying to solve the problem versus making it worse, um, basically just working around it. <clears throat> Good stuff. Okay. Um, all right. So we're going to jump into audience q and I'll invite our other speakers and panelists back in. Um, I have some questions that the audience has been sending in that 
I'll invite any anybody to answer. I don't think they're directed at any one person. Um, and I apologize for like looking all around, but I'm reading questions from a different screen. So bear with me. First things first, um, in you guys' area, and I guess this person is um, asking specifically for the Fort Lauderdale area, which we don't have a Fort Lauderdale participant, but in your areas, um, if the rent amount exceeds what the payment standard is for the specific area, can a tenant pay the difference out of pocket between like what the voucher would cover and what the rent amounts are? Absolutely not. <laughs> it's 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 that's prohibited on the that on the, on the uh, federal level. Right. Um, okay. Do you guys in your communities allow vouchers to be used in less traditional ways? Um, I have uh, been seeing more and more communities trying shared housing solutions using vouchers, um, and then tiny homes has come up a lot in conversation. Do any of your communities allow vouchers to be used flexible, like flexibly for these types of housing? We definitely encourage shared housing uh, with the limited housing resources that we have. Um, we think that's a viable option, especially if they're being case managed. Um, roommate situations can always be problematic. And the challenge for the landlord is that he has to write, he or she needs to write two leases one for each participant and if the relationship falls apart you want to be careful that the landlord isn't left holding the bag so it, it does get tricky but in this marketplace we see it as a viable option um, and actively encourage it likewise in san joaquin county um, we do uh, encourage uh, shared housing it doesn't work for everyone um, it's not it's not designed for everyone. Um, specifically, when we're talking about homeless veterans with with you know maybe mental issues, or things like that. So we, we there's a little caution there, but we're definitely open to it, and and we allow it. And the tax credit landlords cannot allow it, and so it really has to be a truly market landlord that's going to allow you to do it, or if the PHA has built other kinds of affordable housing that isn't restricted. So your pool of units is more limited, but if there's active case management, that can really help. And, and currently in Milwaukee, um, the housing availability has not become an issue at this moment. Um, you know, the developments that we currently have um, offer um, the one bedroom units, the SROs, where um, we can continue to serve um, our veterans through that form. Okay. One question I have that they didn't write in, but it came to mind the landlord or the roommate matching and stuff. Are you guys relying on uh, veteran service organizations or the VA or uh, another party to do that? Or is it people coming to you individually and saying, hey, I've already found a roommate? we want to rent this house or is somebody responsible for matching uh, veterans if they were doing a shared option? For us, not, not formally responsible, but you know, we, we are, our VA, they're very instrumental in working to find landlords and, and, and keep, you know, retain landlords. Um, so if they have happen to have, you know, a landlord that is interested in shared housing, then they would certainly let us know. We we don't do any formal matching. I don't know, Newly, are you familiar with any shared housing cases here? Hey, actually, no. Most of our veterans prefer to have their own place, of course. So there are very few instances where folks are, you know, asking for a roommate or shared housing um, situation. But it's usually coming from the veteran themselves. If they're friends and they want to live together, they found a place, then we'll support that as best as we can. But not not too many instances of it. Great. Okay. I have a question. I think it's directed at you, Newly. Um, this participant saying that they had a veteran who was a part of the HVRP program and stopped communicating after receiving HUD bash housing. Um, and after finding out that uh, she started employment, the case manager basically said that HUD bash didn't collect employment info. And I know it is a policy that, or well, at least like to qualify for HUD bash and other voucher programs, that employment info would be collected. Um, 
So if you guys could, can you elaborate, I guess, on what kind of employment or income information you do actually collect to qualify veterans for voucher programs? Sure. Um, we do ask them if they have employment or any type of income um, because it is a, uh, <clears throat> a, a requirement from the housing authority that they provide proof of income. Um, so, you know, for income limit purposes. So we do ask veterans for their income information and employment information uh, and sending that in pay stubs. Um, once they're in the program, if the veteran doesn't tell us that they're working and they, they kind of keep that from us, then there's really no way for us to know unless we ask and they actually tell us. But we um, encourage them to report their income to the housing authority. Um, we don't collect, we don't keep track of it per se, we do encourage them to um, report it. Okay. And this is a question that comes up a lot in, in topics and in our webinars. Um, how are you all working to house veterans who maybe do not qualify for HUD VASH and also um, are low level sex offenders or have other felonies that disqualify them for the voucher programs? If if you guys have any tips for housing those type of veterans, our audience would like to know. <laughs> um, that's a tough one. We do have a program that's more um, with the San Jose um, or San Jose area because they have more services in that in Santa Clara County of California. Um, <clears throat> it's not a I don't think it's a specific housing program, but it's it is a shelter program, um, transitional housing to help. Uh, veterans with 290 and then from there they get case management from it's it's um it's gpd and hchv so they get the community case managers that work with them in these shelters to help them find housing so that's the one one no but within hud vash unfortunately they don't qualify great and for anybody who's on the line and has never heard of those other programs if you um check out va.gov i know it was uh, mentioned earlier in the webinar, you can find more information on uh, the GPD program and HCHB. Um, let's see. When there are opportunities for developers in your communities, how are you guys advertising opportunities for project-based vouchers or project-based HUD bash? You don't need to advertise. They're coming to us. <laughs> With, uh, I mean, we're, yes. we're only allowed to um, do 20, uh, PBV, 20% 20 of our total voucher allocation. And I suspect most housing authorities, at least in California, are running out of their 20% capacity because it's the tax credits are competitive and uh, getting a PBV allocation increases your competitive score. It's not about getting the maximum points. It's about exceeding your maximum points. And how many points above the threshold can you get? So we don't need to advertise. And it's it's highly competitive for the tax credits. So yeah, we we I we get I get approached, like Elaine says, often we get approached often uh, um, regarding um, project based. But you know when we have um, when 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 we are able to project base, we do issue an RFP to the community. And um, we issued an RFP to the community maybe about a year or so ago for specifically for, for HUD bash and we didn't get any responses. So, you know, that was kind of a, sorry, that was kind of a bummer. We thought, you know, we would get some community response and we didn't, so. I think some of the challenge with PBVing VASH vouchers is that the landlord wants to have the same screening criteria under fair housing for all of their applicants. and because had bash may be a housing first um, participant, it's hard for them to have consistent screening criteria. And they're kind of like, eh, you know, I'm not sure I want to take this on um, because maybe they have to loosen up all of their screening criteria. So sometimes that can become a barrier um, when you're looking at that as an option. That makes sense. There's a couple of questions that ask about navigating um, like searching for housing once you actually have your HUD bash voucher in hand. 
I'm going to try to combine them. Um, but how are you guys helping veterans uh, or others navigate searching for housing where there is lack of affordable housing? Do you guys have any mobility programs? Are you considering developing mobility programs? And um, just a couple of people commenting that they also have issues with veterans locating housing once they have a HUD bash voucher in hand. <clears throat> yeah, that is <clears throat> definitely a very challenging area for us as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we do have a housing specialist that works with us and also a peer support specialist. Uh, so our HUD bash team luckily have multi disciplinary staff with a peer specialist, housing specialist, and also a sub specialist who works with veterans who have addiction issues, um, and then our case managers. So once a veteran has their voucher, the housing specialist is always out there doing outreach to landlords and property managers and trying to advertise HUD VASH and, you know, try to get new landlords to accept our veterans. And kind of going from there it is it is has been challenging because the rent in Stockton has been going up and going up and and all over California actually not just Stockton itself yes so that's been hard to keep to keep up with um, yeah. but we do try our best and for some reason one way or another and sometimes with the housing authorities help because they know some landlords that might be willing to accept hug bash and they give us those resources, so um, we do reach out to that. Um, I'm super excited about the new landlord incentive program that the Housing Authority's been awarded funding for. So hoping that comes yeah. online soon. Yeah. It's the partnership with the city of Stockton, and they're just little, little. You know, we we we're, we're waiting. Um, they asked for additional information, but yeah, we we're going to be rolling out landlord incentives, and we're 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 all excited. Um, we're going to be, you know, that is, that's going to include um, um, application fees, um, one-time bonus for landlords, um, uh, utility startups or arrears for the, the tenants and, and things like that. So we, we're, we're excited. We really want to roll it out. We've been staying in close contact with, with the VA, just, you know, keeping them up to date on any progress. So hopefully this month. <laughs> Yeah. Here in Milwaukee, um, we extend the opportunity of free advertising for our landlords so they can advertise their units with us. We post those on our website and get updated um, every Friday. And we have landlords that reach out to us and ask if um, there are veterans that are seeking housing and they're um, looking to assist them. So we connect them um, with the case managers directly so they can work with them and um, offer the units that, that are available to, to the vets. So um, we do have um, many landlords that um, were vets themselves. So um, definitely, you know, it, it's more of a, a personal touch and giving back um, to the community as well. So Milwaukee's been very fortunate with that. Right. And we find we find that landlords that are that have been veterans that are pre previously veterans oh that are veterans um, are more inclined to assist with with the the, the VASH programs. Right. We did do a webinar um, last quarter on landlord partnerships, so I encourage anybody struggling to build those partnerships to check that webinar out. But that is one of the ways of partnership that we're hoping you guys uh, take away from the webinar is that. If you're a frontline service provider, let's say, uh, or a landlord yourself or work with landlord groups, then reaching out to your VA or your housing authority to kind of get everybody um, acquainted is a good first step to accessing more housing units. And um, the final question and comment, I just want to clarify kind of that uh, we had one participant say or comment that veterans are not a protected class, so giving them preference is not a violation of fair housing, is it? So I would like to clarify that for anybody who is on this webinar. Uh, I don't believe giving preference for veterans in your housing is a violation of fair housing, but they would be subject to the same application, like requirements and standards that everybody else would be. Um, do you guys have anything to add to that? And I know a couple of you mentioned uh, the preference for veterans in your other housing programs as a requirement for the state of California. Um, 
but it is not about a violation of fair housing, correct? That's correct. That's correct. No, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a violation, no. Good. Gotcha, okay. All right, well, that was all of our questions um, that we have time for today. Thank you guys all for participating. And thank you to all of our attendees for also participating. The webinar and the slides will be available um, shortly. And then also on our new website, nchb.org. Uh, we'll have resources, uh, including the podcast I mentioned earlier, the guides I've mentioned, this presentation and the slides from today. Um, thank you guys all again for participating and, and speaking and joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Have a good afternoon. Bye.